Hi everybody, this is Dr. Eric Quorum, founder of AIM7. Welcome back to The Blueprint, where we distill cutting edge science, leadership, and life skills into simple tactics optimized for your busy lifestyle and goals. Today I'm joined by Dr. Brian Mann. Brian is currently an assistant professor of kinesiology and sports sciences at the University of Miami. This is the third episode in a series with Dr. Mann, where we previously discussed the fundamentals of periodization, and auto regulation. If you missed those episodes, make sure and go back and check them out as they'll set the foundation for our discussion today on how we use velocity based training as an auto regulatory tool. In addition, Dr. Mann details how real time feedback is a powerful tool for improving exercise performance. So now it's time to lean in and learn from the best. Brian, so we have talked about periodization. We have talked about auto-regulation using APRE and even wellness questionnaires and body weight. What is velocity-based training and how can you use it to auto-regulate your training and improve the outcomes of your training? Oh, baby, you know, I could talk about this for for days without stopping or taking a breath. So velocity-based training is probably the worst name for it that could ever be potentially made. And and the fault is 100% on me. Uh, Be careful what you say at three o'clock in the morning, because it could just come back to bite you in the the tail end. Your certification Uh, even says velocity-based training. Dude, I know. It It counts out of the bag. Yeah. The the name for it sucks, you know, and and here's exactly what happened. You know, my first book, I talked about, you know, the use of the Tendo in developing explosive athletes. Well, back in, maybe this is like 06 or something. Oh, uh, you know what, dude, it was that, uh, it was the, the one CSCCA that was good. You know what? You and I had that conversation like 10 years ago, right? About the the, the one, one with, with well, yeah, uh, with Martin Rooney and Alvar Meal and Buddy yes. Morris. And that year, right? I The, the Gym Aware and Myo test had just come out or had just come, made its way to the States. And people were asking me at that, uh, I think it was called Port of Call you know, on the way back. Yeah. In Salt Lake City. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Right down from the hotel. They're yeah. like, what are you going to call it now that it, there's more than just the 10 on um, velocity-based training. That's what it is. By the time that I got my ass out of bed and got through the hangover, it was probably 10, 11 a.m. Mm-hmm. I came down and people were coming up like, I like that name, VBT, that's, that's got to stick. And I'm like, oh, what? but it, there's nothing about resistance, velocity of what? And uh, and it just stuck, you know? Well, so it's it just, good. It, it, yeah. it works. Yeah, it flows off the tongue. I but love all how you that say it, the one good CSC. That's well, a whole other conversation. That's a whole other thing. And you know, yeah, but that was epic. Good to hear about of yeah, all that, of them. I, I should have said Al Vermeil's phone number. He calls me to this day. I forgot day about to, that. I forgot yeah. I was there too. Yeah, he was the yeah. one I couldn't remember. Yeah, dude, that one that was epic. I shouldn't have said yeah. the only good one. I should have said the epic one. The epic That's one. what I should have go. said. Yeah. yeah so yeah. Scott Bennett uh, and whoever the president is now, man. Sorry for that comment. They, you know what? It, it happened. <laughs> They're not listening to this. Keep going. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but uh, so it is just the utilization of velocity to dictate load, man. So there is a super tight relationship between velocity and percentage of 1RM. So much so that if you look at a study by a guy named uh, Gonzalez Medillo and Sanchez Medina, uh, hopefully I said those right, and the study was movement velocity as a marker of loading intensity and resistance training. They found that while strength increased 9.6%, maybe 9.7% on average, that the velocity to the corresponding percentage of 1RM, not absolute load, right? But the corresponding percentage of 1RM did not change greater than 0.01 meters per second. So that just indicates that, hey, if you're, uh, let, let's go back to that 135 exam, right? So let's say that my 135 moved at 0.8 meters per second. Well, I know that that's about 60% of my 1RM for that day. Mm. What if it moved at about 0.5 meters per second? Well, I know that's at about 80% of my one RM for that day. So I ha- I can change the load to match the speed to match what I actually, the trait that I'm trying to develop. So if I'm trying to develop power on a squat, well, peak power on a squat or on a, on a deadlift is usually around a meter per second, right? And that just happens to be where peak power is on my uh, zones. That That's the different, that's the center between strength, speed and speed strength. That's the 
the, the point of peak power. And uh, I broke things down into zones. Now, are my zones completely accurate? I, I would say no, they're not completely accurate, but they're pretty darn good. Uh, mm-hmm. If you are for the population that they were derived for, who's the population they were derived for? Division one athletes and str- uh, strength and power sports, football, baseball, and even basketball at Southwest Missouri. And uh, if you've got a direction in your name, you know that you're not going to have a seven foot center. So I think our tallest guy that year might have been six, 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 seven. So of course that the heights didn't vary that much for, for them to go out. And we were also more of a little bit beefier, you know, uh, hit each other instead of running all these court sets. But uh, so, you know, it just worked out to be about plus or minus 0.07, 0.08 meters per second. So I called it good, good enough. And then I just overlaid the traditional percentage uh, of one RM and what those traits those develop, you know, absolute strength, power, blah, 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 starting strength, et cetera, uh, with the velocities. And then we just ran into zones and we just mm-hmm. cared about training within the zone to get the adaptation rather than caring about how many sets and repetitions we would, we would care about the sets, but how many, uh, you know, sets and reps at each load and the reps came, became less important as we went along because of the utilization of velocity loss to mitigate fatigue and, and things like that. So, I mean, BBT is one of those things that you can go uh, as deep down as you want. Uh, so like an average, I, mean, I remember how I would use it. Let's say you're doing power clean. Let's just take power clean, for example. And you're like, okay, we're going to work at 75 or 80%, but we know it's what would, pers- what zone would that be? How, how fast is that? Oh, uh, see back to power clean, 80% on a power clean would probably be about 1.6, 1.65 meters per second. Okay. Now, so Olympic lifts are different because they've got a completely different range of motion. And the zones yeah. were set up for squat, deadlift, and bench press. And I think that that's where a lot of people uh, misinterpret the things that, I, that they've seen uh, or that they've heard versus what they've read. Because, you know, I'm clear about that in the, in the books. But, uh, you know, if somebody sees an infographic, of course, you know, you be careful looking at infographics and taking that to me in real life, people. That, that's all I'm going to say about that. But, like, yeah. if it's 1.6 meters per second, we would hook up the unit to the bar and – if it's moving it within that, like if it's, if it's moving way faster, we need to increase the load. Dude, that's if it. If it's way lighter, then, I mean, if it's slower, then we need to decrease the load. Yeah. And then once we kind of found that zone, then let's say we're, the goal is like, okay, the minimal number of sets we want to get is three. Yep. But let's today, let's say the person's doing great. We've measured wellness questionnaire, their HRV or whatever, and they're looking great today. We'd be like, hey, we're just going to have an open-ended um exercise and they're going to keep going until they drop out of the zone. So they could hit five, six, seven sets. And to me, that's when things get really precise. As long as you're not doing 50 different exercises in a session and you're just trying to get really focused in on like, maybe you got like three core exercises and a couple auxiliaries and somebody's highly trained. Now you're taking advantage. If that is the primary thing that you want to work on that day, you're taking advantage of that window of opportunity. Absolutely. And I think that's where this is really, really powerful. And also um, simply the effect of feedback. I mean, shoot, you know, yes. if you just, man, there's studies with, again, pro athletes, uh, New Zealand All Blacks, I'm assuming since Nick Gill was on the paper, but it was uh, William Randall that where they looked just simply at the effect of feedback on their jump squats, right? Mm-hmm. Nothing very between the two groups as far as percentage of 1RM, sets, reps, exercises, and intensities or anything. One group for, I believe it was three sets of six. Or maybe it was three sets of three twice a week. That's that's the part I can't remember. Three by six, six by three, whatever it was. It was 18 reps over the course of the week. Very, very minimal. And it didn't, the only thing that varied was that they received feedback. You know, they received what the speed was. The group that received the feedback saw far greater improvements in sprint times, which actually surprised me. Uh, vertical jump and standing long jump over the the group that didn't receive that feedback. So it's just amazing that, you know, simply getting the feedback will make you more powerful. Yeah, because and, you're, you're competing in a sense. 100%, man. And you know what? I would just be the chef in the weight room whenever we're using VBT. Actually, I say chef, whatever. And chef because I'm stirring the pot. Right? <laughs> I instigate it and be like, hey, yo, EK, Chris, Chris got a 0.75 at that. You got a 0.7, same way. And I'm just saying, I'm not telling you what to do. I'm just saying. And just let them start competing and, and ripping at it. And, you know, sometimes they knew I was full of shit that, you know, so-and-so didn't actually hit that speed, but <laughs> you know, whatever I could do to, you know, I would, uh, yeah, I would just try and, and juice them up, you know, especially on a day when they were down now hindsight being 2020, 
why were they down? I should have probably looked into some things more like that. But I mean, shoot, you know, 15 years ago, I didn't care about that. You know, it was just show yeah. up and get the results we could that day. But because Dunning Kruger is the thing. <laughs> yeah, there is. So another another uh, lob down the middle for you. So let me ask you a question. Nowadays, like there was the Tendo, then there was a Gym Aware, which for those that don't know, that's there's like an, a there's like a, a string attached to the bar that's attached to this little box, right? Let's just make it really simple. Now you've got Gym Aware. Oh, no, no. Uh, what's the video? base for you got perch what else yeah do you perch have? and elite form elite uh, form and there's what some about, camera based apps what about for consumers any products out there that are really good for the general consumer if they want to try something like this yeah you know they, they've actually gotten a lot better and some of them are, are really really cheap i am still a linear position transducer guy uh and that's the lpt that's the string in the box just like you said mm -hmm. those are two direct measures man uh it's got something called a potentiometer in there you know so it's basically how many times that spool's going around and so that's giving you your distance and then they've got a chronometer in there, basically a stopwatch that tells you how long it was going. Well, velocity is just distance divided by time. And uh, with a little bit upgraded software, now they could get peaks. Well, now, I mean, shoot, that started 20 years ago when they could start getting peaks. But uh, the technology started as an, a Balakov and a stopwatch, you know, a Balakov device and a stopwatch. And then they, they scienced it up from there. So, but the, since those are direct measures, that's always the one that I'm for. And there's ones that uh, we actually are getting on the 28th, I believe, is when we're starting a validation study of several accelerometers, a couple of camera-based apps, some linear position transducers uh, to see, you know, what what's worth its salt and what's not. Uh, and if so you be look at all, look out for those papers. Yeah, baby. You know, we're we're, man, we're starting on the 28th. I don't know how long it's going to take, but it'll be uh, it'll be good. Uh, we're going to look at some of the the body worn IMUs as well as you know a uh, camera based app that my uh, colleague uh, Fra Francesco started using, and uh, he reached out to me, and I, you know people sent me these devices. So I'm like, yeah, screw it, let's go. Let's let's see you know what what's worth it. Some of them are, are a lot better than others, and I'll let the pre. I, I don't want to trash devices, but I will just say that a linear position transducer is still my go-to. Uh, you know, I am I I am a uh, I trust no one. So if I can get two direct measurements, uh, I'm going to take that. Uh, accelerometers are fine, but they only work great whenever you're dealing with things when you're going to have acceleration and not constant velocity because they have to measure the difference in your right. speed. So it's not going to do great if you are lifting very heavy or very light. So, you know, that, that could be a problem. Camera based apps just use the uh, a reference distance and a frame rate. And so it's like, what do you mean reference distance? Well, most 45 pound plates are 18 and a half inches. So then it's going to be able to use that to judge what your change in movement was to see how far you were in the frame rate to use the time. Depending on if they do the start and stop well, they're going to be fairly accurate as well. And that's going along with like the perch, the elite form and some of the apps. Mm -hmm. So that's how they work. Uh, what's going to be best in the computer? Uh, I'm sorry, consumer model. There are some cheap uh, LPTs out there. And then uh, I really like, as far as a cheap unit goes, uh, Flex from Gymaware. Mm. They are a laser and accelerometer based unit. So they're using the reflection of light off of this. Uh, I call it a yoga mat. I don't think Evan likes it when I call it a yoga mat, but uh, <laughs> you know, this yoga mat looking thing that you roll out and then it's using the light reflection to, to get mm. that. And it's, it, it's extremely accurate from my own personal training. Uh, just whenever I would have the gym aware and the flex on the same side, some people be like, "Where well, are you going to look at the opposite side? Because blah, blah, blah. Well, dude, it's a lever. So if the right side goes up, left side goes down, I'd rather get the same information. Same thing, rather yeah. Than, yeah. So that, that one just, sometimes I, I, I think it's done in Kruger. They think that they know and they don't. Uh, so I'm a PhD. It's not, I didn't get a PhD because I'm a dumbass, you know, right. Right? so I can go ahead and, and, and look at it. But you know, the gym aware is a great consumer model. There's been some, you know, great, uh, feedback from people on things like uh, on some of the different accelerometers like BMAX Pro, uh, Fit for Lifts has uh, been th that's been out there that's that's been well done, and I'm sure there's others that uh, I'm forgetting, and people are going to be mad, especially if they're an OBT. Like, why didn't you mention my company? Why didn't you mention it? Well, dude, because it's 15 minutes. God, there's 500 of you companies out there. I had 15 minutes. But, uh, well, this is this is phenomenal. I uh, will put a link in the show notes if anybody wants to get hold of your resources or if you want to get certified in velocity based training, so you can really know what you're doing. If you're a high school coach or a college coach, this is a phenomenal tool that I highly recommend. Brian, thank you so much for joining us. I really appreciate your time. My pleasure, anytime, Eric. 
If you enjoyed today's episode, would you please take a moment and leave us a comment and review in the Apple Podcast app, as this will help us reach more folks with the message of the blueprint. Thanks again for listening, and I'll catch you on the next episode.